Okay, good morning. Thank you that you were on time. Uh, I'm going to talk about Firefox OS, the platform HTML5 deserves. So let's quickly recap why HTML5 is a good idea. Benefits of HTML5 is that it's inbuilt distribution, the web. A lot of people are wondering how do I get my app out there? How do I get my web, uh, my app found? And we spend a lot of money on listing our app. We spend a lot of money of getting our app in the marketplace. A lot of our app in closed marketplace they actually take it away from us without us having a chance to get them again. Is there an opener for that? Or not? Uh, it's simple technologies used by lots of developers. The great thing about the web is I never had to be an expert. If I had a GeoCities page, it looked horrible, but I was already a publisher on the web. And everywhere in the world that I've been, and I've been to many, many countries, I met people that did things for the web. I didn't meet people that were Android developers. I didn't meet people that were iOS developers. <sighs> that was from the fifth floor down the stairs. I met people that did things for the web. And it's an evolution of existing practices. We're just moving on what we're already doing. We're not actually inventing something new. We're just moving the web development stuff that we've done into the app space. It's an open, independent, and standardized procedure. So instead of having a SDK that you can only use for one phone or one environment, everything we do in the web is standardized across different vendors. Which means if in one market people like Android more than iOS, you can still support them as well without having to rewrite your applications. So first of all, we had promises of HTML. When the first iPhone came out, then Steve Jobs was basically on stage and said, no SDK required. Because the best browser on this planet is on the iPhone. It's called, uh, it's called uh, Safari, I think he said. He didn't mention Firefox, sadly enough. But um, that changed quickly, especially after he died. A lot of people realized, like, hang on, we can make money with native apps. It makes much more sense. It's a better experience for the phone. As we're closed anyways, why do we allow people to write HTML5 rather than technology that we can control and software that we can control and IDEs that we can give them that gives them the best experience. So I said that yesterday in my other talk, the comparison between native and the web is kind of flawed. And the problem that I have, and a lot of people have right now, is that it doesn't work. In iOS and Android and other closed platforms, you have these problems. This is a simple thing, form validation, input type required. If I put the required in, it should not send off the form if I don't have something in that field. That works across every desktop computer, including Internet Explorer. It doesn't work on iOS, it doesn't work on Android. Not even on the newest Android. Two days, two days ago, Android announced that the, uh, the web view of Android now is based on Chrome. It still doesn't do form validation. Why should I, as a developer, have to write a JavaScript validation and a server-side validation for all my forms. We have that in the specifications of HTML5. So we have the problem that a lot of platforms that say that they support HTML5 have browsers that are hardwired to the operating system, stock browsers, which get outdated with the operating system. And this is exactly what Internet Explorer 6 was. And we all complain about that. So I think it's time we get a platform that embraces HTML5 and loves HTML5. And that's why we built Firefox OS. Firefox OS is uh, on tablets and phones at the moment. There's no desktop plan for the moment because we have Firefox on desktop and you can use OS X and whatever you want to use. Linux, uh, in Windows even. Uh, tablet is coming the end of this year, beginning next year. Phones are out on the market already. Some facts about it. It's released in eight countries. Spain, Portugal, Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, Uruguay, Mexico, and Brazil. More are coming, I think, in the next two weeks. That's why I'm traveling around all the time. You realize that these countries, except for Spain and Poland, are not countries you will ever hear on an Android or an iOS presentation. And that's the idea of Firefox OS. We've got 18 mobile operators, six hardware partners. The hardware options are Alcatel, OneTouch, Fire, ZTE, Open, Geeksphone, Kion, Geeksphone Peak, LG, Fire, Weed. Fireweb, not fireweed. This is my Android phone, so that was wrong. This is the one that didn't wake me up. Um, and this is the LG Fireweb. This is what it looks like. They're aimed at emerging markets and the low-end market. Uh, it's interesting because we're the, only, we're the only ones doing that. 
We realize that people worldwide have things to say and things to publish, and they should not be locked out by not being able to afford a certain kind of hardware. So we build with our partners hardware is affordable. Now Android said they're going to the low-end market as well, and people ask me what I feel about this, and I'm like, thank you. That's what we wanted. We won. It's a worldwide web. It's not a web for people that have Apple stores. So we needed to do something about this. It's aimed at an alternative to feature phones. So we want to replace feature phones, whereas Android wants to replace older Androids, hopefully, or iOS devices. And it's open source. It's all on GitHub. Here's the price line. In Spain, Mobistar op uh, offers the ZT open for 69 euros, and that includes 30 euros for balance for prepaid customers. So that means if you've got kids and you want to give them a phone, you can spend 70 euro unlocked phone, uh, completely uh, uh, free of any contract. You can put 100 euro on a SIM card and basically give them the phone. The kids can buy apps for 100 euro and not more. You don't have a surprise bill on it at the end of the month. You can also lock this to your telephone provider and say, I want to buy apps on my telephone bill or on the prepaid SIM card. So you don't need a credit card to buy applications, which is another big thing that people have a problem with. The architecture. We have Linux Gong. On, the, on top of that, we got the Gecko rendering engine. This is everything where C++ happens, or C. This is, you can be part of this, it's open source. We're looking for people to contribute to the, uh, to the system right now. But for end developers that want to work with Firefox OS, this is where it gets interesting. We've got web APIs and web activities. These are standardized APIs to access the hardware. Web activities are something like web intents. We've got Gaia, which is the user interface, which is written in HTML5. And we've got third-party HTML5 apps, which are written in HTML5. So the whole operating system, everything, is JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. The rest is just accessing the hardware with a Linux core that also is used in, in Android because we didn't think there's any need to reinvent that one. In essence, it's Android without the Java, and instead we gave it Firefox, and that gave you Firefox OS. And that way we are much smaller in terms of footprint. We are much faster in terms of supporting hardware that is lower spec than Android is right now. It's predictable HTML5 support. The browser and the operating system is built on top of the Firefox rendering engine, which means the Firefox render engine automatically gets updated. You don't have the problem that you have with the other ones. And how about security? Security is an issue on the open web. This is what we have to do in browsers. Ask the user, like, do you want to allow this, 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 this? This is not nice. This is not scaling. This doesn't make much sense. So instead of just uh, making sure that JavaScript can only access the hardware when the user also wants that to, and not malware happening and like script injections, we actually uh, um, ask you to write an application manifest. And that one turns any HTML page into an application. So with this one, you just give it a name, you give it an icon, you give it a description, and you go on with that. You have uh, four different types of security. First one is web content. That is regular web content. We don't trust that. We don't give it access to anything that might be a problem for the end user if it gets access. So you cannot access the camera, you cannot access, uh, you cannot access the address book, but you can access all the other things that HTML5 promises you. Offline storage, um, accelerometer, all these kind of things that you expect. An installed web app gets a bit more access to the things and actually gets much more local storage, so you can store real data rather than only chunks of data. A privileged application gets more access and more responsibility. And the last one is a certified application, and that's device-critical ones. These are ones that only Firefox, or Mozilla, and partners are building. There is a massive wiki page that explains all of that. Nothing in there is secret. Everything is in the public. You can dial into our meetings if you want to, and you're really bored, and you want to hear people talk about bugs that you don't know about. Permission model is defined in the manifest file. So you say, I want to have contacts, and I actually want to read and create contacts, and I want to have an alarm, and I want to require to schedule notifications. All of this is defined with web APIs. These are JavaScript APIs that are uh, sent to W3C and the Word Working Group and sent to other browser makers as well to implement. For example, these are the ones that work for everybody on the web, like every web content, our pages. Vibration API, web payment, in-app payment is possible, payment from the application itself, ambient light sensor, I showed that one yesterday. Battery status API, 
This is how to read out a battery and see how, how much it's charged right now. Everything is just a JavaScript uh, property and JavaScript uh, uh, events with callbacks. So there you can find out how much the battery is to give people a simpler interface when the battery goes low, for example, or give them a warning. Screen orientation, you can lock the screen orientation, which is uh, very, very important for some games because people don't want to shift them around the whole time. So you can just screen, mouse lock orientation, portrait, and the other values are landscape, primary, secondary, and so on and so forth. Vibration API used to be Vibrator API, lots of stupid jokes, so we renamed it into Vibration API. Since yesterday, also supported by Chrome. This one just says navigate a vibrate 1000 and then vibrates the phone for, the, for a second. You can give it a, um, an, an array and then vibrate stops, vibrate stops. Network information API. What is my connection? Am I connected? And is, it a is the bandwidth more than zero? Then I know I'm connected. And is the connection metered is what I can read out. So that way I can find it if somebody's on a 3G that actually has only so and so many megabytes to download or somebody's on a wireless to ask them, hey, do you want to download all the data now? Which is a good idea because our markets are emerging markets where you pay per megabyte. Ambient light events, just read out the, uh, the device light and then you get a lux value from 50 to, uh, to 10,000. I showed that yesterday on stage and it works on MacBooks as well because uh, the backlit keyboard is using exactly the same sensor. Page visibility is very important because that tells you if the application is currently running or if it's in the background. And you just read that out by having a visibility change uh, event and in there you read out document hidden. And if document hidden is true, then the app is not, uh, not currently used. If it's, not, uh, if it's false, then it's no. Yeah, if it's true, then the app is hidden. If it's false, then the app has focus and is being played with right now which is a good thing to actually stop, for example, animations or stop downloads and these kind of things. Privileged apps have things like device storage, the browser API, if you want to have an own browsing interface in your, in your app, contacts API, system XHR. System XHR allows you to read content from, uh, from data sources on the web because we can't allow it to go through cross-domain anytime that you want it to. The contacts API looks like this. Uh, new MOS contact, init Tom. And then you have a unsuccess and on error handler for success or error. And that's as easy as getting a new, uh, a new contact into your book. The certified applications have access to all the rest. Web telephony, web SMS, web Bluetooth, camera API, all the things that you want to have. If you cannot build a certified application because you're not a partner or you're not building a phone, how do you get access to the camera? That's the thing that everybody wants to have. I mean, there's a few things of doing that. There is WebRTC, uh, which is working on desktop as well, but that would ask the user to, do you want to do that? And you, you cannot do it in an app. But there is a better way of doing it. So the certified apps are all for the OS itself. That doesn't mean that this is away from you. You can still look at their source code and learn from them. And they've been built together with our partners. So another big difference between, uh, the, between Firefox OS and other, and other operating systems is we don't work with mobile partners just to actually get them to build phones for us, but they build part of the operating system itself. itself. And in, in, JSS, uh, in JS, CSS, and HTML, rather than like in hidden code that they can't release later on. So if you want to access the camera and you, you cannot actually ask the user to install it as a certified or packaged application, there's web activities. Web activities are like intense. It's a little ecosystem of applications on your phone itself. You say like, okay, like a right click on a desktop, you open this with this app. The same is with web activities, just in a dynamic fashion. So if I want to have an image, I don't want to access the camera. I just want to have an image. Why should I ask the user to access the camera when they want to upload an image, for example, as my app? I don't care where the image comes from. I just want to have an image. So I want to have something like that. Pick the image from the wallpaper, the gallery, or the camera. And this is how you do it. Get a photo. Most activity name pick, you give it the mime type of an image, and then you get an on success handler that gives you the image back as a, a, as a blob URL. The same way with a telephone call. You could say like most telephony call this number, and that one would then most activity call, and that one would, would switch to the dialer app. The user would take the call, hang up, and it goes back to your app automatically. It's not like a tell domain in iOS where I'm in the dialer and then I hope the user goes back to my application. I have a full feedback loop to what I've been doing. 
And you can uh, uh, list your app as a handler for certain activities as well. So you can make the talks on the uh, the apps on the phone talk to each other that way. This works on Android and on iOS. So this is already implemented in Firefox across the board. How do you distribute apps? You go to the marketplace, you pay a lot of money for advertising, you give people stickers and postcards, right? That doesn't make any sense to me. We have the web for that. Why should I have to actually go into a closed place to get people software? We already have the web out there. So we have a marketplace because people want them and this is where you do your pricing and this is where people actually can review your page, uh, can write reviews and also comment on what's going on. But you can also app install any application from the web. So all you do is Moz app install and then you got an on success and on error handler and you point to the manifest URL. And you can put this onto any button in your page. This means if you already have an optimized view of, uh, on mobile of your app, uh, of your website, you can put this button in there, test if Firefox OS is supported just with the Moz apps install first, and then you can install the application full screen with local storage and all the things that you want to have with one single button. You don't need to go through the marketplace. You can if you want, of course, it's good because then we know how many we have, but uh, you don't need to. And this is what is much, much better than any of the others. And we have a few people from Google, from Adobe, uh, from Amazon, and from Sencha looking at this packaging format right now as an idea for these platforms as well. Because we don't need to reinvent the web. We already have it. There's a distribution channel for that. Now, as these apps are HTML5, we can do better than just asking you to search for the name of the app. This is the dynamic app search. So I enter the name of a band and it finds me music applications. I enter the name of a movie and it finds me film applications. I enter chicken and it finds me recipe applications and applications that have to do with restaurants. For the end user, this means they can just sit in a, in a waiting queue and just type something in when they just look for the movie. What is a movie app that I have about this? I can put Eredev in there and I would probably find Lanyard and find the reviews there of Eredev rather than or the application if they already have it indexed. And this is not searching your phone, this is searching the web. And this is why we made app discovery as easy as actually surfing the web. If people click on one of those, they get the optimized web view, the HTML5 version of that app. So that means they don't have to download 50 meg, enter their, their credentials, say yes to everything before they try out the application and then discard it again. In a market where you pay per megabyte, this is just not fair. So this one is a try before you buy of any application really. And with you, it means that what you already have on the web becomes the advertisement for your application. Super powerful, super interesting for people, especially when you show it to people that use iOS or Android, they're not used to that. They're like, why doesn't that find my apps on the phone first? And you're like, because it's not the most relevant app for that at the moment. Development environment, big thing, big thing. Like, how do we develop for HTML5? The biggest question I get from people and the answer in our case is like, this is the browser, so why should we have another piece of software you have to download? This is a Firefox OS phone, and if I now start this here, the screencast, you can see that this is Firefox. And I just go to Web Developer, App Manager, and I get the App Manager. I can now uh, attach the phone, and the phone shows up in my App Manager. I can connect to the phone, uh, say on the phone it's alright to connect to it, and then I can start installing my applications, which are just HTML pages on my hard drive. I shift this over, the application is installed. As these are HTML5 applications, they don't have to be on my hard drive, they can be on the web as well. So I put this URL in, update that one, and now it's installed on the phone as well. Of course, installing it is not only the thing that you need to do. You can start the app now and start debugging it. And you debug it with the developer tools that are in Firefox already, which you can use on the desktop as well which have things like break on DOM changes and like all kind of reflow testing so you can find out what's going on. In this case, we rename the button here right now to FUBAR. This is a packaged application. This thing is already running on the device and we can still change the HTML without having to recompile it all the time. You can try uh, JavaScript here, so he sent an alert 42 to this phone. And if you don't have a device, you can always use the simulator, which is part of the app manager as well. You can start the simulator and this one then starts the phone on your hard drive and as a simulation. So you can see what it looks like here and you can try it out. If you don't, you don't have to wait for hardware before you start developing because that's the worst thing that can happen to developers. So the settings application is a certified application as part of the operating system. It is packaged. But in the, uh, in the developer tools, you can, of course, play with it and change it and look at the source code. 
you can uh, pro you can stop that in your application, but in the apps itself, we don't need to. So in this case, we just have the HRs in between that we recolor to red and resize to 0.5 REM and give it a margin to the bottom. So if you just have a few glitches and you just want to fix them quickly, you don't have to repackage and redistribute your application. You can do that directly on your computer. And you can just saw that as their HTML, you just take the CSS out and it looks differently. You can tap onto the device to actually try out, uh, to highlight different nodes, much like a click on a desktop in the developer tools. And you can rename them and you can save all of that to your hard drive, repackage it and send it back to your server or send it back to the marketplace later on. You can, uh, the home screen itself of the operating system itself is written in HTML as well. There's nothing in there that is closed technology. So I can take these LIs here right now and I can mess with their CSS as well. So I find the style here and I say, okay, these are not right. Let's rotate them. So you just put transform rotate 90 degrees and it rotates them 90 degrees. And you can also scale them to like two to make them bigger, which makes them useless. But also it shows that it can be done. So the development environment is your browser. And we did a survey just right now with somebody and developers start in browsers. So why should we send them somewhere else that we have to maintain? This way we keep our developer tools up to scratch all the time as well and not do things that they don't need to do, but we just think are cool. There's a Firefox OS boilerplate application. This one is the one you want to start with web activities. This one just has stubs in there that show you how the things work. So if you don't want the other ones, except for the pick image, just delete these buttons, delete the rest of the code, put your code inside the pick image one and you're done. It's written by Robert Nyman. And uh, yeah, we just built this to make it really easy to get started because we do workshops all the time where we help people shift their apps over and they were a bit confused about what, uh, what the web activities might be about. You can prototype with JS Fiddle. JS Fiddle is a great tool for prototyping and also to show code to other people and collaborate with them. I showed you yesterday in the other talk that we also have um, collaboration over audio and video in there now with the, uh, with the Together JS thing. And in, in JS Fiddle, you can just put a uh, slash FXOS at the end and FXOS and HTML at the end, and then you become an install button and you can install the thing on your phone. I could show you this live on my computer, but I just upgraded to Mavericks and that is not really working yet. Building blocks. People want to know how do I start? Why, why? Not everybody wants to start from scratch. Not everybody is as crazy as I am. So we've got buildingfirefoxos.com. This is originally how we built the interface, the Gaia interface of the operating system. So this one gives you all the HTML and the CSS and the output of what it looks like. So you can take a look at that, how we done the original look and feel. We have design guidelines as well on the, uh, on the, uh, on the pages that I'm going to show you that tell you uh, what a good app means, how we do interaction in Firefox OS to give it a bit of consistency, but we don't block you from doing things. We don't tell you this has to be the one SDK to rule them all. Mozilla Brick uh, is the next one that we're working on. The difference here is that we're using uh, tags, but uh, using web components. So this means this works much, much faster than, uh, than the components themselves because it's not rendering in the DOM any longer, but it's rendering as part of the browser. What's coming next? More APIs, of course. We always want more APIs. So we got file handler, WebRTC is coming, Web, Web NFC, Web USB to support keyboards and joysticks and whatever you want to connect with USB, uh, spell checker API, calendar API, sync API, and there is a the wiki page that I showed. Just look there every month. There's something new, and nothing in there is just for Firefox. Everything in there gets sent to the other browser makers for review and like, do you want to implement them as well? And please do. So my life the next few weeks, we'll be talking to Sencha, we'll be talking to PhoneGap, we'll be talking to uh, Amazon and other people and show them how we implemented all of those. I don't want people to reinvent the wheel. If we need anything in the web, then it's less fragmentation of technologies. I'm tired of having to write three lines of code for three different browsers. And if we, as a non-for-profit organization, give it the code for free, it just drives me nuts when people do their own thing just to sell more hardware or something like that. This is something that's brewing right now for end users, for mom and dad users. We have an app maker and the app maker could be a good prototyping tool as well. This one just is a drag and drop uh, uh, widgets onto a phone and publish the button and have the phone as a Firefox application. So that's appmakermozillalabs.com. 
And I'm going to use uh, web components as well. So this is a very simple way to start your app and then get the source code and play with it. Resources, what if you want to know more? The developer hub is where most of it starts. Marketplace, firefox.com slash developers. There you've got design guidelines, you've got applications you can download and play with to actually start from and take their look and feel and put kittens in there and make millions. You can learn how to build applications, how to write your manifest file, how to actually upload things. And you can publish your application where it tells you about the monetization models and how to do in-app payments and how to get filthy rich with your application. Mozilla Developer Blog is hacks.mozilla.org. I'm one of the bloggers there. Uh, Robert Nyman is the main editor for now. And there we put out things every two days about Firefox, about open HTML, uh, uh, the HTML5 world, about Firefox OS. So there's a good chance that you find the thing that you need to do there in like a copy and paste manner, but please read up as well. We don't want to be in a uh, in a W three C schools, W three schools, or um, or Stack Overflow world where people just copy and paste code and then complain it doesn't work, although they didn't understand what's going on there. There's a video series where I pestered a lot of people in the office asking them different things about Firefox OS. That's coming out every Thursday at the moment. So I'm covering web activities there, uh, Mozilla Brick, uh, web components, all the things that we're using. And these are like five-minute videos that you can watch in your, uh, in your lunch break or whatever. There's a wiki page. This is where the metal comes. This is where everything is being discussed, like how to flash phones, how, how the operating system itself works, um, getting help from the community, getting involved in Firefox OS. This is the un edited version of like what's brewing right now. So you find a lot of exciting stuff there, but not necessarily the stuff you can use immediately. And this is all I have time for, so thank you very much. How is that? We got time for questions. <laughs>